Okay, I think we can get started. Okay, today we're going to continue uh, emerging memory technologies, uh, which we spent the last lecture on. Uh, hopefully it's an exciting topic to many. And this is an area uh, that clearly is going to have a lot of impact on memory technology in the next uh, decade and afterwards as well, I think. So there's going to be more to see in this area. And as, as, you, as, as you remember, we're already seeing uh, a lot in this area happening right now with phase change memory, 3D X point, uh, et cetera. Okay, just to jog your memory, uh, we were talking about resistive memory technologies, especially. These are more scalable than DRAM because they're not charge-based and they're also non-volatile. And we talked a lot about phase change memory. Hopefully you remember how it works. And if you really want to delve into the details, I would re uh, highly recommend this IBM Journal of Res Research and Development paper, which talks about the details uh, as of, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very fundamental paper, but uh, you can also see the state of the art as of 2006, uh, 2008 or, or so. Okay, as we discussed, emerging memory technologies have many shortcomings as well, uh, but also they enable opportunities as well. The key question that we've been trying to answer in the last lectures, can we somehow enable them to replace, augment, or surpass DRAM? And we've been looking at DRAM uh, since our focus has been relatively uh, a lot on main memory, and main memory is clearly a big bottleneck today. But you can also imagine some of these technologies potentially replacing or augmenting or maybe surpassing on-chip memories like SRAM, uh, which is also interesting, which is also very difficult to replace. But uh, you may have actual room for non-volatility uh, on, on your chip, if you, if you want, if you don't want some data to be lost after you power off your chip, for example, you may actually need some, uh, non-volatile, uh, memory on your chip. Uh, for example, if you want to store your security keys and if you want to encrypt them, et cetera, on chip, uh, and if you don't want to regenerate them for whatever reason, uh, it may be good to store them in some non-volatile memory, or you, you can make your entire cache non-volatile and we will see some potential benefits of, uh, doing so, uh, uh, later in this lecture, hopefully. Uh, you can have all of your system to be persistent. That way, directly, you can manipulate persistent data structures in your cache, right? Uh, without losing uh, any data on a power loss, for example, or a system crash, uh, or some other unfortunate event that uh, uh, gets rid of your... Uh, uh, comp uh, so for some reason, uh, causes you to lose data, uh, lose power, let's say. Okay. And we've been talking about phase change memory, pros and cons. Uh, hopefully you're familiar with this now very well. And we were discussing how to mitigate the shortcomings of phase change memory and how to find the right way to place phase change memory in the system. And I showed you these pictures that we had drawn in 2007 or so when we were first looking into this topic. Uh, and we talked about hybrid memory quite a bit uh, last uh, lecture. And we also talked about directly replacing DRAM such that you don't have hybrid memory. And we said that this is a difficult task going into the future there. Uh, and it may not be easy to replace DRAM because phase change memory is not, uh, maybe phase change memory is not the memory that has uh, the right properties to replace DRAM. And maybe you need to re-architect too much uh, to uh, overcome the shortcomings of phase change memory uh, to entirely replace DRAM. So we, we'll focus a lot on hybrid memory, uh, but we'll focus on the persistence aspects of phase change memory or non-volatile memory in general uh, in this lecture. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the opportunities and challenges of these technologies. And then we will talk about uh, some research issues going into the future, because there's a lot to do actually. Even, even though uh, something like uh, Intel 3D X point is available at this point, its latencies are not very good. It has endurance problems, et cetera. Uh, and maybe that's not the best way of actually designing uh, an emerging memory technology to replace DRAM. Maybe there are other ways uh, to do it. And there are a lot of system level challenges, just like we saw in uh, processing in memory. There are a lot of system level challenges in emerging memory technologies as well. And we will talk about some of them. Uh, and we've been talking about opportunities actually. So I will start with opportunities first. Remember the slide, uh, we said that emerging memory technologies can enable new applications like very fast checkpoint and restore your computer may be able to boot up much faster than it boots up right now, for example, because everything is in persistent memory. You don't need to load uh, stuff from disk into DRAM anymore. You, just, you can just directly operate from the persistent memory or you, direct, uh, you, you uh, load from persistent memory uh, to 
uh, DRAM for whatever reason, because DRAM is still faster. Uh, it may be the re uh, this is a hybrid memory approach we talked about. But this can enable new applications, as you can see. And this is actually very interesting. Pursuit can we actually uh, enable some new applications this way. It can enable more robust systems and new, uh, more robust applications also uh, by ensuring that whenever your main memory loses power, you don't actually lose data, right? So that could be useful. Uh, and all the way up to caches, for example, you can have persistent memory or non-volatile memory. As a result, you never lose data. Uh, now, this may be a good thing for robustness, assuming you've designed your application such that uh, you don't lose data on a power loss, but you may actually get into inconsistent states if you didn't design your applications correctly. Uh, and we will talk about uh, that also. When, on a power loss, uh, whatever data that you may have written to persistent memory uh, may not be in a consistent state. So if you actually don't modify your applications, uh, you may actually run into this consistency problem. It's called crash consistency problem. Uh, you may actually have updated part of your data structure, but not some other part. And if you trust that your memory is persistent and it will come up uh, with, with all of the data updates that you made after uh, the power loss is handled somehow, yes, it will come up, but you may start in a state that's not very good uh, for your workload. Uh, you may actually need to checkpoint your workload in a more interesting way. So I will briefly talk about that and I will recommend you some papers that we're not going to go into more detail on, but this is a system level problem that happens. Uh, okay. And the last one, as we talked about in the last lecture, these memory technologies, uh, resistive memory technologies enable uh, various types of processing that's tightly coupled with memory, processing using memory uh, in our terminology or computation in memory. Uh, essentially, uh, they uh, enable AMBIT-like approaches just like uh, we did with DRAM, AMBIT and row clone. Those operations can be done. They enable uh, even more uh, row activations uh, concurrently. Uh, leading to some other functions. And also a crossbar structure in resistive memory technologies enables you to do a matrix vector multiplication uh, using Kirchhoff's laws, uh, uh, very fundamental. Uh, and this, this has fascinated quite a few people recently. And people are using these memories to accelerate uh, machine learning workloads, which heavily rely on matrix vector multiplication, clearly, uh, to do convolutions. Uh, and we talked about this briefly, and I recommended you a bunch of papers that talk about that. Uh, so in all of these, I, I will uh, not go into a lot of depth, uh, but the last thing I'm going to cover is this merging of memory and storage, because this is really interesting, uh, especially today, uh, if we have memory technologies, emerging memory technologies that are much closer to main memory in terms of their performance, uh, maybe uh, you can eliminate some of the storage hierarchy, or maybe some of your storage hierarchy becomes not so essential let's say. And as a result, uh, you can store all your persistent data uh, in a persistent memory that houses both your working memory uh, that you don't care about persisting after power loss, and also your persistent storage that you care about persisting after power loss. And this could enable a single interface to manage all data, as opposed to the multiple interfaces that we use to manage main memory and storage devices with. Uh, and we will talk about that uh, right now. Again, feel free to ask questions uh, anytime. But let's start with how things are done today. Uh, so today there's a dichotomy between memory and storage, clearly. Uh, memory, and, th and the main reason for that dichotomy is over decades, uh, the, uh, the, the speed of DRAM uh, increased much more compared to the speed of a uh, hard disk let's say, in terms of bandwidth, for example. Uh, but latency has always been very low also in DRAM compared to uh, something like a hard disk. So there are orders of magnitude latency difference between DRAM and hard disk. If you remember, uh, a hard disk access takes two to the 17 cycles or so, give or take, two to the 15 to the 17 cycles, assuming a four gigahertz processor, whereas the DRAM access takes about two to the nine uh, cycles or so. So there's a, there, there are uh, orders of magnitude, as you can see. And, as there's, uh, and, and these devices have been very different from each other. That's one of the reasons why this has happened. So uh, hard disk devices evolved. Uh, well, they were persistent, clearly non-volatile, basically. Uh, but they were slow. And they were block addressable. Because whenever you go to a hard disk, uh, 
uh, you read a block. You don't, you cannot read a byte easily, at least. I mean, you can read a byte, of course, but then you need to change your interface of reading a hard disk, which makes it extremely costly. So existing devices uh, normally uh, read a block, let's say 512 bytes or larger, uh, and you use that uh, to build your file system on top of it. So they're block addressable devices as opposed to byte addressable devices. So that's one of the major distinction uh, between hard disks and DRAM in addition to the performance, in addition to a non-volatile feed, as you can see. Now DRAM on the other end, as we know, is volatile uh, uh, unless you do a battery backup, uh, which is costly as well, but it's uh, normally DRAM is used volatile. Uh, it's fast clearly, as we've discussed, and it's byte addressable. Whenever you access, you can update a byte. Uh, if you want to, of course, uh, in, in many interfaces today, it's, uh, it's really 64 bytes, right? It's the cache line, cache block size uh, because the memory controller happens to communicate with DRAM that way, but it doesn't have to be that way. It's, it can be byte addressable in the end. Uh, okay, so where does NVM or emerging non-volatile memory technology sit? It's basically a combination of, of the properties of both DRAM and hard disks, let's say. Uh, essentially, they combine the properties of memory and storage. They're fast. Well, they're closer to DRAM, much closer to DRAM. If you remember that picture where I showed you where these memories lie on a uh, linear uh, line or uh, yeah, uh, on, a, on, a, on a time scale, uh, non-volatile memory is much closer to DRAM. Like something like phase change memory is much closer to DRAM. STTM RAM is even closer to DRAM and uh, they're much farther away from hard disks. So they're fast, they're byte addressable. So they're very similar to DRAM. They don't have the limitations of uh, disk head, let's say, uh, trying to read uh, a particular amount. Uh, uh, and they're also on top of uh, everything else, they're also non volatile So they get rid of the slowness of storage. They get rid of the block addressability problem of storage, meaning that they're much closer to memory than storage. In fact, sometimes these memories, emerging memory technologies are also called storage class memory. Actually, IBM calls these technologies storage class memory. And I, that's actually a, a nice terminology, I think because clearly NVM is not distinguishing enough perhaps because this could be considered NVM, SSDs can be considered NVM as well. Uh, by the way, everything I said about HDDs, hard disks are actually true for SSDs also. They're non-volatile, they're slow, they're block addressable. Uh, at least in the current usage, they, you cannot address them uh, byte by byte. Going into the future, that may change uh, because SSDs actually uh, have the property uh, that you could actually potentially design an interface for them that could be byte addressable but it's very hard to get the slowness uh, of the, at least the NAND flash memory uh, out of the way. Okay, so uh, going back, these are called storage class memory because uh, they have the non-volatile aspect of storage, whereas they have the speed and byte addressability of memory. Clearly volatility is not necessarily desirable uh, unless you built your system to rely on non-volatility and applications to rely on non-volatility, right? Which we have been doing for decades and decades unfortunately. So transition to a completely non-volatile system uh, where your updates are going to uh, persist after power losses uh, is not that easy because we have in with the mindset that whenever you're, you get a power loss or whenever you power off your system, your DRAM gets wiped off, right? Or your on-chip caches also get wiped off. And people may actually been, uh, be relying on the fact that uh, this happens uh, to fix some potential performance issues, et cetera, right? Uh, clearly the joke uh, in, uh, maybe the unfortunate joke in uh, computer systems is uh, if you don't know why your computer has slowed down or uh, something happened to it, reboot it and it may go away, right? And it is true, part, partially, uh, the, uh, actually a good, a good chunk of the reason why it goes away is you get rid of the volatile state uh, that may be causing the problem. And there's a lot of volatile state on your CPU. There's a lot of volatile state in DRAM. By powering it off, you get rid of all of that volatile state. And hopefully you get rid of the thing that was causing the problem uh, at that point in time. Okay. Okay, so to uh, keep it short, basically the, uh, the, uh, the storage class non-volatile memories enable uh, a potential uh, replacement of both DRAM and storage devices as we know them today. So we can actually have just this, let's say. Okay, and that may, be, that may not be realistic as we said, because uh, this may not get close to the uh, but uh, keep that in mind. So let, let me go into this two level memory storage model a little bit more. Uh, 
So if you look over here, traditionally, we have designed two-level storage models, uh, memory storage models. We, this, this is called a two-level store. Basically, we store volatile data in memory. This, these are our data structures that we manipulate in the programs. These are our temporary data structures that we're not going to persist, or cached data structures that are from files, for example. Uh, and they're stored in main memory. And the main memory is fast, clearly. As a result, we access uh, main memory with an interface that's completely different from the interface we use to access storage. So we use load store instructions and the instructions set architecture clearly. And these are heavily optimized. Uh, we use virtual memory and do address translation so that we can actually virtualize uh, the addresses uh, that we manipulate in physical memory so that we can ease the programmer's life clearly with that virtualization. And clearly there's a lot of effort spent on accelerating this virtual memory part. Address translation is very fast. We have very specialized acceleration structures inside the processor and the memory controller to do the address translation, like translation look aside buffers, page walkers, etc. They're all there to accelerate this virtualization layer uh, to, for main memory so that your loads and stores can go really fast. Why? Because your main memory is fast. You don't want a very hefty uh, layer, virtualization layer uh, that takes, let's say, I don't know, one microsecond when your main memory takes 50 nanoseconds, right? That would be terrible because you would be wasting the potential of the device. Uh, it doesn't make sense to uh, do one microseconds of translation to, act, to, do, to do a memory access of 50 nanoseconds. So this is much faster, clearly. This is much faster than uh, uh, 50 nanoseconds, let's say. Okay. Uh, but if you look at the storage side, as uh, uh, solid state drives uh, or hard disk drives, uh, they're slow. Uh, hard disk drives are on the order of milliseconds, solid state drives are on the order of microseconds. And these are manipulating persistent data clearly. Uh, so persistent data is stored here and we use a completely different file system interface to access it. Whenever you uh, want to uh, open a file, you do file open. You, or you want to read from a file, you do a file read, file write, file close, et cetera, and different file manipulation operations. And these go through heavy software layers. Essentially, these invoke the operating system and the file system. And there are a bunch of checks that are performed to ensure that you're, you have consistency, et cetera. I'm not going to go into the detail of the storage system right now, which should actually be a nice lecture actually in the future, probably not this year. Uh, but basically the uh, issue is this translation layer uh, that you need to go through takes a lot of time. By the way, these two layers are actually relatively similar in that in terms of what they do. This does translation plus access control. This also does translation plus access control to the first order. But they're doing it for different devices and they're doing it for different kinds of data, persistent data and volatile data. So keep that in mind. These two are actually they have similar functionality, give or take uh, at the first order, at least. Clearly you can find differences because you're manipulating files, et cetera, over here versus bytes here. Uh, okay, so this today takes on the order of, I don't know, maybe microsecond flights. Uh, and actually, uh, people are finding out that because this takes on the order of microsecond, uh, microseconds and flash uh, uh, drives are also microseconds, this is a big bottleneck in terms of accessing flash memory. So people are trying to remove this or make it as lean as possible to access flash devices so that you don't waste uh, the bandwidth and the latency of flash devices with an equally uh, long latency uh, software system calls, right? But hard disk clearly, uh, this is on the millisecond level and microsecond level, okay, maybe you can waste a microsecond uh, to access a hard disk uh, that will take 10 milliseconds anyway, let's say, right? 10 milliseconds is on the higher end today, of course, but depends on the hard disk, you may get two, two, three milliseconds, two milliseconds, but one microsecond is still three orders of magnitude uh, uh, lower, uh, lower than, uh, uh, well, uh, yeah, lower than a millisecond, clear. So basically, if your storage device is slow, you can accommodate a very slow translation layer. Let me put it that way. But if your storage device is fast, uh, then you cannot do that. You have to go through uh, some hardware specialization, clearly, for your translation and security layers. Okay, let's take a look at the storage over here, and let's replace it with uh, persistent memory. Uh, this is a bit of a different take from what we did earlier, right? We, we did earlier, okay, let's replace main memory with persistent memory. Now let's, I'm saying, let's take, a, let's do the easier step. Let's replace our storage device 
SSD with phase change memory. Now, clearly that would win you, uh, buy you a lot of performance because uh, uh, as I said, uh, phase change memory is let's say 200 uh, nanosecond and uh, flash drive is one microsecond or higher. So you would buy a lot of latency. But now the problem is this becomes an even bigger bottleneck uh, in accessing the persistent uh, memory, phase change memory. Basically, now this is nanoseconds and this is microseconds. Right? So the operating system and file system code to figure out where your data is, uh, translate the data and buffer the data become performance energy bottlenecks with fast NVM stores because this is not keeping up. Hopefully this makes sense. Uh, so today actually what people do is they do memory mapping of uh, files. Uh, what they do is they actually access the storage device, they map it into main memory and then they do the updates in main memory as much as possible. And then they move the data back over here and they do enough buffering in main memory, multiple copies actually to ensure that they don't lose the original data. Uh, for whatever reason. Uh, so you need to make sure that you you're in a consistent state if you get a power loss, for example. Now, the major issue over here is uh, the first time you're doing the setup, you incur still a lot of overhead uh, going through the file system calls. Uh, plus, uh, uh, you cannot always do this buffering because sometimes you need to synchronize your files so that someone else can read from it potentially. Uh, that's another issue. And plus the big issue is really when you uh, run into power loss type of issues. Imagine systems where you get a lot of power losses or you have intermittent power. Uh, whenever you actually buffer persistent data in main memory, you may lose some of your persistent updates that you're supposed to do because you didn't write it back uh, to, uh, to storage. Okay, so today you can actually try to overcome some of those issues, but they all have disadvantages. But uh, clearly, uh, regardless of whether or not you try to overcome those issues, you still need to go through uh, this translation layer, at least sometimes, and they lead to big bottlenecks. Okay, and you can see that there are similarities between these two translation layers. And the idea is, uh, why not do this basically? If, if the devices that you have, uh, DRAM and persistent memory, phase change memory are very similar in terms of performance, why not actually make everything persistent in terms of your main memory and unify the memory and storage management into a single unit to eliminate all of that wasted work to locate, transfer, and translate data and design this unit to be more closer to this part while not getting rid of, while having the characteristics of persistent data structure management. So, and we call this the persistent memory manager. So it's a single layer. It's also called single level store uh, in, the, in the old terminology, because uh, at some point in the, in the 50, 1950s, 1960s, systems used to look like this. Uh, they had uh, this core memory and it was persistent, but later DRAM came along and disrupted uh, the hierarchy of storage essentially. It basically created uh, its own layer itself uh, to, so, that, uh, uh, so that you don't waste the characteristics of a DRAM device, which was actually much faster than what you had in the 1950s, 1960s. Uh, so DRAM is actually a technology. If you go back 60, 70 years ago, DRAM is a revolutionary technology that came along and it basically uh, moved the system from looking like this in 1950s, 60s to looking like this, which is a huge change at that time. Clearly computers were not as popular at that time. So making changes were a lot easier in 1950s and 60s. Okay, today maybe we should go back to the future, let's say, and uh, maybe go back to thinking about a single level store again, but maybe you think we need, to, we need to think about things differently as we will see in the next few slides. So maybe we should go back to thinking about having a single layer of management because our devices are actually very fast now, both the DRAM and non-volatile memory. Uh, if you look at STTM RAM, for example, it's as fast as DRAM in terms of reads. Uh, phase change memory is almost as fast as DRAM. So maybe we should actually be manipulating our persistent and volatile data structures through the same interface using load store instructions. So that's the idea over here. Uh, so uh, this improves both energy and performance as I will show you because you don't need to go over two different interfaces and uh, to locate transfer and translate data. Plus you don't need to use a very slow interface for very fast devices. And in my opinion, uh, in the long term, at least it simplifies the programming model as well. Today we program, uh, today we don't have a good way of manipulating files uh, directly inside main memory, right? We go through some hoops at the system level to uh, enable that, but uh, by doing memory mapping of the files, uh, 
but that's not natural, right? Because we still need to open a file, memory map it, et cetera, uh, update the data, and then ensure that uh, the file, uh, the updated data is persist uh, written back to the persistent storage. That's a lot of overhead on the programmer. If the programmer could just say, okay, this data structure of mine, it's an array, and I declare it to be persistent, meaning whenever I'm going to do an update, I would like that update to be reflected uh, in uh, persistent data storage. Uh, I don't care where it is as a programmer, let's say. I have this virtualization layer that's called Purchase Persistent Memory Manager. And the Persistent Memory Manager ensures that it's going to be a persistent update for me. That way, the programmer now doesn't need to deal with a persistent file, not persistent file. It can declare a file, and it's assumed to be persistent. And whenever a file is manipulated, you do it with loads and stores directly. So you don't need to memory map it. You don't need to open it, et cetera. Uh, so basically, it's a, it's a very powerful abstraction. You just do loads and stores. Uh, I mean, you may need some other primitives to support persistence, but we're not going to talk about that. But it's much simpler than uh, two different interfaces that the programmer needs to deal with today. And it's much less error prone, let's say, because uh, you, don't, you don't need to open closed files, uh, et cetera. OK, so that's the premise of uh, a persistent memory, if you will. This is a disruptive solution that basically takes us back to the future or back to the past. Back to the future means back to the past also. Uh, 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 back to, uh, when computers were first designed. But we need to think of it differently, as we will see, because underlying memory should be very heterogeneous. You cannot say, OK, one, uh, because we, we have come along a long way uh, uh, over the course of 70, 60 years. Uh, you cannot just say, OK, I have some sort of memory and I'm replacing it with some other one. It's not going to be as easy to do that as we discussed in the last lecture. Maybe you actually have uh, a variety of memories over here. Uh, OK, so that, there's a question. Can we use DRAM as a cache to persistent memory so that we don't lose performance? And that's a great uh, uh, suggestion. And actually, the answer is yes in the end. <laughs> and I'm going to uh, discuss that. And that's a good approach. Uh, but you still need to be very careful in terms of what you cache. But if this is hardware managed, and if it's done relatively quickly, uh, uh, the benefit is whenever you get a power loss, you can potentially save uh, the state that you cached uh, that is supposed to be persistent, uh, that, you, that you cached in DRAM, uh, quickly back into the persistent memory. So yes, the answer is to, our, to your question is yes. And you need this persistent memory manager to be intelligent uh, to do that management. OK, OK, so that's great. Uh, basically, you need multiple memory technologies under, underneath, uh, I believe, uh, going into the future. And if you're really interested, you can read this paper that we wrote uh, about seven years ago now, actually. As you know by, uh, by now that the research is done a couple of years before the paper is written. Uh, but we wrote this paper uh, that talks about uh, hardware software cooperative man management of storage and memory, and it basically argues for this sort of person memory manager and I think there are a lot of, uh, there's still uh, interesting research uh, to be done based on that paper that is written. Uh, uh, and I will discuss uh, some of that uh, soon. But basically, this is what we're thinking. Uh, the persistent memory provides an opportunity to manipulate persistent data structures directly using load store interfaces. So it's, uh, let me give you an example. So this could be one programming model, potentially. Uh, with persistent data structures. People have actually developed this sort of programming models in the 80, 1980s, 1990s. And they did not take off because there was no device that enabled bi-addressable manipulation uh, of uh, a persistent data, uh, which is like phase change memory, for example, or STTM RAM. We didn't even have flash devices at that time, right? So this didn't exist. This didn't exist in 1980s, 1990s, at least in the mainstream. Uh, clearly, we had DRAM and hard disk drive, and there was a huge gap between DRAM and hard disk drives. Uh, so these persistent programming languages uh, did not have a lot of impact on the world, but maybe it's time to revisit some of them. So how, do, how does this work? Uh, you basically have persistent objects. So this is one way of looking at it. You can, for example, declare a persistent object this way. If you're really interested, uh, if you want to minimize your disruption to the program, you can call it a file. But uh, that could be a file that has an array data structure, for example. That could be this array. So that's going to be your persistent array, right? And whenever you want to update uh, data, you basically do this update, let's say. You update the end element of the array. And the value is persistent in this case. Basically, really directly updating some persistent data structure, a persistent array, which is clearly interesting. And you're just using loads and stores here. There's no file open, file closed, 
memory map, etc. You don't do any of that. You basically just declare persistent. And this is not the only way of declaring persistent. You could say persistent array my data, for example. Uh, and then you can do a persistent updates to the data structure. So it may not be this easy. There could be other things that you may need to do, especially for the crash consistency problem that we will discuss in a little bit. But ignore that crash consistency problem for now. So it's as easy as this uh, uh, to update persistent data. So you could have a volatile data also in your program. Uh, as long as you declare something that volatile, or you don't say persistent, for example, everything's assumed to be volatile. That way, that, that can get placed in DM, for example. Uh, or if it gets placed somewhere else, uh, it could. Uh, uh, the operating system or the system ensures that uh, whenever uh, you, uh, let's say, uh, quit the program or whenever the system crashes or whenever the system reboots, uh, whenever you have a power loss, uh, the data that you have in that uh, in non-persistent data structures are also uh, gone. Uh, and you can do that clearly with a persistent memory manager that's intelligent enough to know what should be persistent and what should not be persistent. So the job of the persistent memory manager is to interact with the program and maybe get hints from system uh, soft, software operating system and runtime to ensure that this whole works correctly. <laughs> That's the idea. And also at high performance, right? And it's a software hardware cooperative solution. Uh, you need to do the data layout. You need to figure out what uh, data structures go to which device. And you could have actually many devices as you can see today. We don't want to uh, say, we're getting rid of some device because some device may have good characteristics. It manages persistence. It manages security like uh, existing virtualization layers do today. Virtual memory is one example. Uh, storage system, file system uh, interface is another example. Uh, virtual block interface that we discussed in an earlier lecture is actually a very synergistic with what we're discussing over here. Uh, if you remember when we discussed virtual block interface, uh, we said that it's a hardware managed virtual memory system. Uh, and uh, clearly it has software implications also. So it's not just hardware managed, but it's also software hardware cooperative uh, and it manages multiple things. And, and I think it's, it's, it fits very nicely. And we motivated with heterogeneous memory, even though we didn't talk about persistence issues, but uh, virtual block interface is a good uh, thing that uh, fits into this de description of persistent memory manager. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the persistent memory manager in a little bit, but I'm not gonna answer all of the questions related to it, this is still a good research area that multiple folks uh, are working on. Uh, but I will say one thing, uh, one other thing over here. So this is completely changing the programming model clearly. So if that's not desirable, what you can do is you can have the existing programming model, let's say file system based programming model, uh, and you can translate it uh, to a programming model that looks like this. So there could be a dynamic binary translation for a translator that can potentially translate an existing file system-based model uh, to something like this. That may not be extremely efficient, clearly, uh, but you, uh, that way you could actually uh, translate uh, the existing programs uh, as efficiently as possible to something uh, that emits loads and stores. And you may not actually directly translate it to this data structure level uh, program. You may actually tra directly translate the operations of the file system, et cetera, to loads and stores and keep metadata and the translation layer over there to ensure that everything works correctly, the translation works correctly. But in the end, you access persistent data with loads and stores if you do that. So there's certainly an opportunity to do that if you want to minimize disruption into uh, existing programming models, which, not, which is not easy to clearly adopt in general because we're modifying software significantly over here. Okay, so hopefully you share my excitement uh, that this is very, very interesting and it could be very disruptive. Uh, and let's talk about this persistent memory manager over here. So uh, the way it's envisioned, this persistent memory manager uses access and hint information to allocate, locate, migrate, and access data in this heterogeneous array of devices. And you can have many arrays, and you could, ex you could potentially abstract away uh, these devices from the programmer. But of course, the programmer can provide hints, right? Programmer can say, okay, maybe I want this data really in flash for whatever reason, if they know what they're doing. If they don't know what they're doing, the programmer can provide semantic information, right? Uh, uh, like we discussed in the virtual block interface. Uh, uh, also, we discussed in more expressive interface like expressive memory. We may discuss more of that actually. I mentioned that uh, in, in a previous lecture. Uh, but basically the programmer can provide information about uh, 
okay, I want this sort of security property, this sort of locality property, uh, and I want this sort of latency property from my data structure, if they know what they're doing, of course, uh, persistent memory manager, please find uh, a solution for this. I'm going to give you some more examples, actually, of this in a little bit. But basically, this opens up a whole new uh, way of thinking about managing memory, as opposed to today's way of thinking, which is I have main memory and I have files. I have to manage everything, basically. <laughs> OK, so let's go into a little bit more detail in the Persistent Memory Manager. And uh, this paper, as I mentioned, it's going to be one of the uh, optional readings, I think, in your next homework. By the way, I'm providing a lot of optional readings uh, just uh, uh, to give you a possibility that if you're doing a lot of reading, uh, you get the opportunity to get a lot of bonus points. But if you don't have time to do that reading, you don't get penalized for it because this is all completely bonus uh, for people who do it. OK, uh, so this persistent memory manager exposes a load store interface, as we said, to access persistent data, but to access other data as well. And applications can now directly access persistent memory. Uh, they just do loads and stores. There's no conversion, translation, location overhead for persistent data that exists in file systems. The PMM uh, manages data placement, location, persistent security, and that's a lot to manage clearly. But we're doing a lot of that today, actually, in existing virtual memory systems uh, in a software hardware cooperative manager. We also, well, virtual memory systems don't manage persistence. OK, that's granted. But we're doing a lot of that in the storage systems today. Actually, we're doing all of this in the storage system today, uh, maybe in a very slow manner. Well, that's the difficult, that's a, that's a difference uh, from the persistent memory manager. The Envision persistent memory manager should do all of this relatively fast, because the fastest devices are really fast, as you know, uh, uh, from VRAM and phase change memory and STTM RAM. So there's a lot to manage, yes, but a lot of that, uh, a lot, there's a lot to manage today anyway, to begin with. But I think the difference is uh, you need to be fast today. Uh, you, you need to be fast because we have very fast uh, storage class memory devices. Plus, uh, you need to do a lot of things in hardware, and maybe uh, you need to consider a lot more hints from software because the underlying system is very heterogeneous. Uh, so we want to get the best of multiple forms of storage. OK, here you, you, may, you may be thinking, actually, maybe uh, machine learning based mechanisms in this person memory manager actually could be useful. And I agree that it, they could be very useful. So there's still research to be done uh, in both heuristics plus machine learning based mechanisms. OK, so there's a lot to do over here to get the best of multiple forms of storage. On top of this, clearly, to be able to do this, you need to manage metadata. Uh, you need to have some metadata to uh, associate with, for example, data structures that's, that uh, describe the properties of the data structure, where they're designing right now. Uh, so uh, the, the properties can be architectural properties in terms of semantic properties, in terms of what's communicated from the uh, programmer or the system. Or they could be properties that are microarchitectural in terms of where the data structure is put right now. Uh, or uh, those could be properties that are discovered during runtime uh, by the persistent memory manager, similarly to what we've discussed in hybrid memory managers, right? For example, hardware has great capability to discover locality characteristics of different pieces of memory regions. It, we could, you could generalize this to data structures, and data structures in the end are collections of memory regions, clearly. Uh, so you could actually uh, keep metadata that's microarchitectural that can be manipulated dynamically. So there's a lot of metadata that you may need to keep uh, store, retrieve, update, et cetera. And clearly, this can lead to overheads that need to be managed because you, you want to do this at very low latency. Uh, so clearly, virtual memory subsystem uh, suffers from some of the similar met metadata, page tables, TLBs, page walking structures. All of them are metadata to ensure that virtual memory works, right? And clearly, there's a lot of overheads if, uh, to, to, to be able to do that fast uh, with, uh, with uh, hardware support. It's similar in this case, but it's a little bit more complicated probably because now you need to also keep track of persistence, et cetera, heterogeneous arrays of devices. So we want to actually be bolder than a virtual memory system. But as we discussed, virtual memory system imposes these large overheads to begin with. Uh, and we wanted to get rid of some of, that over, some of those overheads uh, as we discussed when we talked about virtual block interface. That's why I think virtual block interface is really moving toward the direction of a persistent memory manager, even though it's not discussed in, in that work. But clearly, it's uh, the hybrid memory, heterogeneous memory management is discussed in that work. OK, so you need to be careful about the overheads whenever you're pushing uh, something to hardware and you're requiring things to be managed at low latency. 
Okay, on top of this, I think exposing hooks and interface for system software and the applications, there should be applications here, but I think that's kind of said over here, uh, to enable better data placement and management decisions. So this is a, a very hardware software cooperative. Uh, so let me give you some examples uh, of this. Let's assume we have heterogeneous devices and now we're gonna talk about storage versus memory. Clearly we saw hybrid memories and hopefully uh, you can see that this sort of person memory manager can potentially manage hybrid memories as well. Uh, so all of the ideas that we discussed in terms of hybrid memory management mechanisms, like the Banshee idea that does uh, page table based management could be applicable over here also. So you could actually append the virtual memory subsystem or you could completely replace the virtual memory subsystem to manage persistent mem memory or heterogeneous memory uh, as we discussed earlier. Uh, uh, but uh, you need to include the storage or persistent uh, uh, data aspects in it right now, uh, uh, which is different from the last lecture where we discussed hybrid main memory, which did not, did not talk about persistent. So let me give you an example of heterogeneous devices. So a persistent memory exposes a large persistent address space, but it may use many different devices to satisfy this goal. Uh, uh, your, your fellow student mentioned that you can use DRAM as a cache for uh, cache for uh, phase change memory, for example. So you could you could actually use many different devices to satisfy this persistent address space goal. Uh, you can use uh, less fast, low capacity volatile DRAM to slow high capacity non-volatile hard disk device or flash and potential other NVM devices in between, like we talked about. And performance and energy can benefit from good placement of data among these devices. You can utilize the strengths of each device while avoiding their weaknesses if possible just like hybrid memory we discussed. So let's take a look at uh, two characteristics, important application characteristics, locality and persistence. And different data can be at different uh, levels of this characteristics clearly. So I'm going to uh, very crudely uh, show, uh, but fundamentally show these two axes uh, that uh, characterize your data. Uh, you can, uh, so as you go from top to bottom, you get low loca more locality. Uh, and as you go from right to left, your data uh, doesn't need to be persistent, basically. And there may be different shades of gray for whatever reason, uh, clearly in locality, but maybe in persistence also, uh, it's al always good to keep your mind open. But for example, uh, you may have a data structure that has little locality, but needs to be persistent. These are columns in a column store in a database that are scanned through only infrequently because they're persistent, they're in a database, they're part of the database tables, they have to be persistent but they're scanned once in a while. Uh, basically you do a huge scan in a streaming manner across these columns. So maybe flash is an okay place to place it. If you remember, uh, we discussed phase change memory uh, versus DRAM. You don't want to place a, a low locality uh, or at least low temporal locality. So implicitly this is temporal locality, uh, low temporal locality thing into DRAM. Uh, if you have a high spatial locality, which may be the case over here, it may be okay to keep it in a device that's relatively slow, but reasonably okay bandwidth with buffering. Okay, so this fits nicely to this dimension. On the other hand, if you're frequently updating an index uh, in content delivery network, for example, that doesn't need to be persistent uh, because you could always reform uh, your content delivery network index again. Uh, when you have a loss of power, for example, then you place it in DRAM because this is important. You, you're frequently updating this and you may be frequently needing it also potentially. You have good locality uh, and you don't care about the persistence of it. So you can see that you can potentially provide these characteristics to a person memory manager and person memory manager uses these characteristics to figure out which device is a good fit for the data that's characterized or uh, in the uh, with these semantic properties. And this is just two axes, clearly there could be more axes as we discussed. Okay, and applications or system software can provide hints for data placement. Sometimes some of these data characteristics can be figured out automatically uh, by uh, hardware as we discussed also. Persistent may be a very difficult one to figure out clearly, uh, but locality is not a so difficult one to figure out. Uh, in fact, sometimes uh, dynamic hardware uh, is a better place to figure out the locality characteristics because the programmer have, may have no idea sometimes, right? Depending on the programmer's expertise uh, and also depending on uh, the input data sets that's run uh, at that point in time, which clearly uh, may not be uh, within the uh, realm of understanding for the programmer, right? Okay, 
So let's take a look at uh, this sort of persistent memory manager. I'm going to evaluate three different systems. I'm going to give you some real results. And there's a lot more results in the paper that I mentioned. So we're going to look at three different baselines. The first one is a, a true level storage uh, system, which has a hard disk drive, which is obviously very slow. This is a traditional system with volatile DRAM memory and persistent hard disk storage, which is similarly to what you have in many systems, except your hard disks are probably replaced with SSDs today. Uh, so in this case, clearly you have overheads of operating system and file system code and buffering for persistent data management in hard disk. Uh, okay, and we're going to see how bad that overhead is, and it's going to be pretty bad. Uh, the second is non-volatile memory baseline, which essentially takes this hard disk and replaces it with phase change memory. Let's say, okay, I'm going. Uh, I, I say NVM over here, but in this case, a particular NVM we're going to evaluate as phase change memory. So, as I said, this NVM is much faster than hard disk. So we're going to eliminate a lot of the device access latency, but we're not going to eliminate the software uh, overheads of file. Uh, system access. Okay, basically, this still has the operating system and file system overheads of the two level storage model. So the model doesn't change, the two level storage model doesn't change, but your device changes significantly. So we're going to see how much benefit we're going to get from the device without changing the model. On top of this, uh, we're going to look at a, a what is called what we call persistent memory. Now we're going to uh, use only NVM in this case. So we're going to actually eliminate VM. Here we have still DM. Here we have still DM. So we're going to actually hamper us a little bit. Uh, but we still want persistence. That's one of the reasons. And we also want to uh, look at a comparison that's uh, less, more pessimistic than optimistic. Uh, if you can actually outperform uh, the MVM baseline with persistent memory, that's great. Because uh, we use only NVM because uh, there is no hard disk anymore, clearly, in NVM. Uh, but we don't have DM. So here we have DM. We're going to eliminate DM from the system. Okay, but the difference is all data is accessed using loads and stores. There is no operating system and file system overheads. So this system doesn't waste time on system calls. So it assumes that a good persistent memory manager is implemented with a lot of hardware support. So it's no different from the virtual memory uh, subsystem that's used to access uh, main memory with loads and stores. Okay, so hopefully this is clear. Uh, the model is different here. This is one level store, a single level store. These are two level stores. Uh, this has DRAM plus HDD, very slow. This replaces HDD uh, with NVM, but it still has DRAM. This replaces DRAM and NVM with NVM. Basically, this gets rid of the uh, DRAM in the system uh, but while changing the model. So your fast memory is gone. Your overall memory is slower than NVM, but you don't waste time on system calls. So let's take, a, uh, and also data is manipulated directly on the NVM device, as we discussed clearly. Uh, I think all data is accessed using loads and stores uh, follows from uh, that. So each of them imply each other. OK, so this, this is the benefits that we're going to see, basically. So this is your hard disk-based system. Most of the time is spent on accessing the storage device. Doesn't look good. Uh, if you replace the hard disk with phase change memory, you get a 24x performance improvement on this workload, which frankly, I don't remember what the workload was. But there are a bunch of workloads that are examined in this paper. Uh, you can look at them. They're, they're, they're usually storage intensive workloads. So storage, the system is a bottleneck in this case. That's why uh, you get 24X performance improvement by simply replacing your hard disk with phase change memory device. So now to be fair, uh, there should be an SSD somewhere over here. And I think SSD actually moves you from 24X to somewhere over here. So it's cut, it's, it's getting a lot of benefits, but clearly non-volatile memory is much better. So going from non-volatile memory to persistent memory buys you 5x. Now, what, we, what have we done? We got rid of the system calls, so that bought us performance. But we also got rid of DRAM, and that cost us performance. As a result, we are still much ahead, 5x. So system calls were actually really important to get rid of. And if you look at this non-volatile memory two level, the system call is the bottleneck over here. Here, the storage access device is the bottleneck. Here, the system call is the bottleneck. Okay. Uh, in, in terms of the broken down execution time over here. Okay. So if you actually do what we discussed, if you actually use DRAM as a cache for NVM in this particular system, you would do much better actually. So I'm going to show you results with that in a different work, but you would actually, you could actually get to 10X or so much better. Okay, 
So let's take a look at the energy. The energy story is very similar. If you have just hard disk plus DRAM and two level storage model, you're wasting a lot of energy on system calls, et cetera, uh, plus the device. When you replace the hard disk with non-volatile memory, phase change memory, you get 16x perform uh, energy improvement. And when you change the model, get rid of the system calls to access persistent data, uh, plus get rid of DRAM in the system, you still get about 5x. Uh, so there's a question. Did you add DRAM to the persistent memory model to see if you get a, even a higher speed up? That's a very good question. No, not in this work. So these graphs are without DRAM. But uh, in a later work that built upon this work, uh, we did add DRAM and we get even higher speed up. So that's the 10x that I mentioned uh, over here. You get basically very close to uh, a system that looks like you just have DRAM in the system. Uh, so it's, it's actually much better. So uh, somebody asked, I assume avoiding DRAM makes the design of first memory simpler, right? Yes, absolutely. You're right. Now you don't need to manage because now all of your main memory is persistent. You don't need to manage uh, the DRAM uh, separately. But of course, you lose performance, but your design is much simpler. So that's a very good question. So good. I think people are following, and they're actually uh, making the right trade-offs. That's, that's exactly the reason why uh, we did not add DM to the system over here. But of course, I mean, uh, for uh, we could have evaluated, but uh, for we didn't have time at that time, uh, because we were really pushing toward this direction. And as you will see in a later work, we do evaluate, and we get significant benefit. I'm not going to talk about that work in a lot of detail, but you can read uh, that in detail. OK, so this is the paper that introduces this person memory manager. Uh, uh, and uh, you can read more about it. And I think this paper still uh, lays out the ground for a lot of ideas that could be examined. And in my opinion, the virtual block interface is a paper that builds upon these ideas. Uh, but of course, it doesn't exploit persistence. So it's not really directed towards storage and memory management. But uh, it could easily uh, be adapted to manage storage and memory together. Uh, true for expressive memory uh, work that I mentioned earlier also. OK, I will move on to the next work. If there's uh, other questions, feel free to ask. So that's good. Uh, I think I received a lot of uh, good questions. Uh, I will also make a joke over here. This is, what, this is perhaps the only paper I've seen authors from both Intel and AMD, because we collaborated with folks from both uh, uh, groups over here. And these, this is while they were working at Intel and AMD at the same time. Uh, it's not because somebody went from Intel to AMD and their affiliation changed, not, not for that reason. OK, so the challenge and opportunity is combining memory and storage, as you can see. Uh, and uh, I think a unified interface to all data is actually our, uh, was our imagination and goal. Uh, and this actually, you can take it to the next level, right? It's not just, uh, so whenever you access data, uh, data, uh, we, we, we've been talking about a single node so far. It's really uh, your memory device uh, or your memory and the storage. Uh, but data is actually much greater than a single node, right? What about network, right? What about some other, uh, some other uh, data in some other uh, processor's memory? So maybe you could have a unified interface to all of that data in the world, right? Or in the universe, I don't know. Of course, your addresses need to be uh, commensurately large. But with a 128-bit address, you could actually uh, address a lot of things in the world. Uh, so I think uh, the next steps uh, over here, in a, uh, in a way that's not discussed as much in the previous work, uh, but having a unified interface to all data may be useful, potentially, uh, so that uh, you could, uh, for example, address some other device uh, uh, in some other part of your data center uh, with re re remote direct memory access uh, methods, but maybe you don't need remote direct memory access. You just uh, partition your program's data structures across the world, let's say. And it doesn't need to be just your program's data structures. It could be some data structure that's independent of your program, but you could address it in some way, right? So I think this is uh, something to chew on and something to think about, because today we actually have capabilities with very fast interconnects. It's not just PCI, but it's, uh, we, we have the capability of having optical interconnects, for example, in a data center that could be very fast and that could be very high bandwidth. So it could have access to a storage uh, location in your data center. And today's data centers are actually uh, getting disaggregated. Uh, you, you can have storage devices, storage servers, you can have compute servers, and you can potentially have memory servers also. And this sort of disaggregation may require a unified interface to all of the data 
uh, that you may need to access in a data center. But I'm thinking even broader than a data center. What if you want to address everything in the universe, universe with a unified interface? This may stretch your mind a little bit, but uh, it may also enable different opportunities, right? Uh, I can access, I, I can, I can address my, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, the bus that's running on one of the streets uh, in Zurich, right? I can communicate with it in some way. This may be good or bad, of course, uh, but let's take uh, a potentially good approaches to it. Uh, then I can uh, offload some work to that bus because I know that there is work uh, that needs to be done locally uh, in that bus, right? For whatever reason, right? This enables actually uh, computation across the ed edge, across uh, many, many devices that are distributed as well. Uh, if you need to communicate with them through some other interface, like the network interface, uh, then you're losing some opportunity over there also. Uh, so uh, the other interface that we did not talk about is uh, one of the big interfaces, network interface, clearly. And I'm imagining all of those to be unified memory, storage, network. Okay, so I have some questions over here. What about the hardware cost of replacing an HDD with NVM with similar capacity? So that's a great question. Uh, and in this, in this uh, work, we did not really... Uh, think about cost. We just wanted to look at uh, the opportunity in terms of uh, the benefit we would get. But you're absolutely right. Uh, to, in today's uh, technologies, uh, replacing uh, a hard disk or tape, let's say, uh, is very difficult at the same cost levels uh, with phase change memory, for example. So it's not going to be easy to replace a hard disk uh, if, if you put cost into the equation. That's why I think uh, in the end, we want a heterogeneous array of devices to satisfy the cost equation as well. But this was more of a, a futuristic uh, or potential study to see what happened if we replaced our full hard disk. And yeah, how, how expensive is that NVM expect to be versus a hard disk drive? So that's also a very good question. It's going to be expensive. So NVM is not uh, going to be, uh, so uh, even though NVM is expected to be much denser uh, than DRAM, uh, it's not expected to be much denser than uh, hard disk drive, at least today, as far as I know. Uh, for flash, I think the jury is still out. We will have to see if it's uh, if NVM, like phase change memory, let's say, at some point can be denser than flash. It's not clear uh, at this point, I think. But for hard disk drive, I can easily say that it's not going to be as dense uh, as hard disk drive, let alone tape, because tape is actually uh, much denser. Right? Okay. Okay, clearly uh, today there are possibilities that exist. Actually, when we actually wrote the paper in 2013, we didn't have this device, but potentially you could build that persistent memory manager layer uh, with Intel's 3DX point technology today. Uh, um, now, it may not be as easy as what we did in simulation, clearly, uh, but there, there, there's potential here to actually do some real system work. And this is actually a very good research direction, I think, to examine uh, uh, going into the future. And I mean, uh, I, I had to put this over here. Uh, uh, you could potentially, this could be one of the devices that you can have in the heterogeneous area of devices, right? And you could offload computation to your processing inside the DRAM engine as well. So that introduces another level of challenge clearly. Uh, now you're actually manipulating data inside your DRAM devices. You may be actually accessing data inside your VM device also at the same time. Then the question is, of course, how, how do you coordinate that, et cetera? So, and, uh, but, but basically, the heterogeneity in the array of devices that you can have is increasing today. And these are two examples that are available today that you can put into your uh, underneath your persistent memory manager. OK, uh, so uh, there are no other questions. So I'm going to keep going. And we're going to stop uh, to take a break after the end of this lecture 16A. So I'm going to talk about another key challenge in persistent memory, or one key challenge in persistent memory. So far, we've been talking about opportunities. I'm going to switch to all the challenges. Uh, so clearly, building that persistent memory manager is also a challenge, satisfying cost uh, in terms of and latency and capacity and energy requirements. Uh, in terms, uh, that's a challenge. Uh, managing heterogeneity is a challenge. But let me talk about one challenge that I uh, alluded to, which is. How do you ensure consistency of the system and data if all of your memory is persistent? That's what we're going to assume right now. Uh, so there are two extremes uh, to answer this question. One is uh, programmer transparent. Let the system handle it. Basically, programmer writes a program. Uh, they don't specify anything. Uh, and your underlying memory is persistent. And you're supposed to ensure that there's no problem. 
So we're going to see that this could be a problem in existing systems because you may get a crash at a bad point and you may have inconsistencies in your data structures. Uh, so uh, that's one. Uh, or the second is programmer only, mean, meaning let the programmer handle it, meaning let the programmer manage your data structures such that whenever you get a crash or whenever you get some un, un, uh, uh, undesirable behavior in the system, software crash or uh, hardware crash, et cetera, uh, uh, power loss, et cetera, uh, programmer writes their program such that it could handle all of those uh, gracefully without losing data and without uh, losing computation as well. So the problem with programmer transparent version is whenever you get a system crash, your program is at some point, you updated some things persistently. Okay, you crashed. Uh, now uh, the system com comes back up. You restart the program from the beginning. Now you have a problem, right? Because you crashed, you've already updated uh, your data structures uh, to the location until which you crashed but you restarted your program from the beginning. How are you, uh, are you going to do the same updates again? Well, you cannot do it because you're in an inconsistent state, meaning uh, you have already updated some of your data structures. You have not updated uh, some other of your data structures and you're starting from all from the beginning, which means that you're going to operate on inconsistent data. Part of your data structures are updated based on operations that you were not supposed to have performed because you crashed and part of your data structures are not updated, so you're completely inconsistent, so you're going to get garbage value, meaning that you need to do something in your system to ensure that uh, if your memory is persistent, uh, your, your, your programs still work correctly if your program is not aware of the persistence. Now, if you uh, say, it's not my problem as a system and hardware designer, it's the programmer's problem, then you need to clearly define interface to the programmer, and the programmer needs to ensure that they write their programs using that interface, and then you need to, of course, support your interface uh, in the hardware uh, and the software to make sure that that interface does not lead to problems, right? So these are two extremes, I think, uh, and maybe there are answers in between. Uh, and I'm going to show you the upsides and downsides. Clearly, the programming only puts a lot of burden on the programmer, puts some burden on the system design, but it's not as bad as this burden. But programmer only uh, approaches don't uh, uh, basically allow existing programs to run or you need to manipulate, you need to do something special for existing programs, legacy programs, like disable this persistent memory somehow for legacy programs, which uh, where, where the programmer did not go and rewrite the program, right? Uh, whereas the programmer transparent approach runs everything seamlessly. It has, it's completely backward compatible. You don't need to do anything for existing programs. Uh, plus you don't need to do anything for new programs also. So it's, it's more easy to adopt, if you will but the system complexity is much higher compared to programmer only. So this is a classic example of programmer architect trade-off. Again, as we've seen earlier, uh, whenever the programmer's job becomes easier, which is programmer transparent, architect's job becomes much harder. And whenever architect's job becomes easier, programmer's job becomes harder. Uh, and clearly this is one example. And there are many alternatives in between. So uh, I've already given you an example of crash consistency problem actually. Uh, basically, you crashed. Uh, at the point of crash, you updated some of your persistent data structures. Uh, now you go back uh, somehow, you restart your program, but you've already updated some of your data structures, right? That's bad because clearly you're in an inconsistent state. Are you going to use the old values, etc.? Uh, that doesn't sound good, right? Uh, so let me give you another example. Uh, I think uh, this example is moot given that I've given you the earlier example, but. Let's assume that you're adding node to a linked list. Uh, clearly, you need to do multiple operations over here, link to next and link to previous. If you get a crash somewhere in between, uh, be, uh, before you, this node gets linked to this node, you may actually lose the linking. You may actually even lose the linkages somehow. As a result, uh, your data structure is even more inconsistent than just data values being inconsistent, right? Your, the, the, the data structure pointers uh, may also be inconsistent. So that doesn't look good. You may actually never be able to traverse your data structure uh, uh, in the future if you're persistently updated that, but didn't persistently update this link. Basically, there are many different ways of getting inconsistent memory state. If you don't do anything about this problem, uh, you persistently update, uh, all of this is persistent, basically, all of the data structures. If you don't do anything about it, you actually run into a lot of issues whenever you get a system crash, software crash, hardware fault, et cetera. 
whenever you need to rerun your program or part of your program, you have this problem. Okay, so current solutions are actually not programmer transparent. They basically put the burden on programmer. They basically say, programmer, it's your job to make, manage consistency. And you can read some of these papers. Uh, they're actually interesting. Uh, they go, 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 back, go back as early as uh, 2009, as you can see. Uh, so basically, the key idea in many of these works is the programmer basically specifies atomic uh, pieces of code. Uh, that should be executed transactionally, meaning uh, either all of the code is executed or none of the code is executed, okay? And whenever, whenever a crash happens, you go back to the beginning of this atomic state. Or assuming this is all executed and finished, you start from the end, okay? So this is very similar to an idea called transactional memory, uh, which we briefly alluded to, I think, in one of the lectures in the past. Uh, the idea was originally developed in early 1990s. Actually, there's, there's an ISCA paper in 1993 uh, by Morris Hurley and uh, Elliot Moss that describes transactional memory. It's very similar, basically. You encapsulate what needs to happen, all or none, uh, in your transaction. And you ensure that uh, if a crash happens in between, you don't update anything in this atomic block, and you go back to the beginning of the atomic block. That way, whenever you recover, whenever you, the crash finishes and you come back, you're in a consistent state at the beginning of the atomic block. Why? Because the programmer ensured that nothing is updated inconsistently. Okay? So it's very similar to locking a critical section, but it's done in a transactional manner, in an all or none manner. So clearly, this sort of solution is very interesting, no question about that, but it limits adoption as we discussed. You have to rewrite code with a clear partition between volatile and non-volatile data using this transactional abstraction uh, to update uh, persistent uh, data. And this leads to a burden on the programmers. Uh, so let's take a look at an example code. What do you need to do? Let's assume that you want to update a node in a persistent hash table. Assume that your hash table is persistent data structure. Uh, and this is the code that you start with, which doesn't assume any persistence. So this is a regular uh, hash table update uh, copied from some interesting hash table library, let's say. Uh, and this assumes no persistent data structure. So if you use this, uh, you need to be actually careful. You need to actually change uh, the uh, update to be transactional. So you need to encapsulate to uh, ensure that this hash table update uh, is uh, done transactionally because there's clearly values that you're reading and writing. And if somebody else is actually also reading and writing those values, that's not good at the same time. Uh, so you need to do it transactionally. But more than that, uh, your entire data structure needs to be consistent uh, whenever you get a crash. Uh, so clearly, uh, some things need to be declared to be transactional. Uh, and some functions also need to be transactional, as you can see over here, uh, which is finding uh, the thing that you were supposed to update. Uh, so you need to basically, I'm not going to go into details of exactly, since this is a particular interface, clearly. You can read about these transactional interfaces. You need to manually declare persistent components. Uh, you can see some of these manual declarations. You need a new implementation of some functions because they need to be transactional again. Uh, and they need to work interoperate nicely with the other transactional functions. This is very similar to thread safe functions. If you ever programmed with multi-threaded programming in C especially, uh, you need to have a notion of thread safety clearly. Uh, and if you have a non-thread safe implementation of a function, and if you use it in a thread safe uh, function, then you're back to square one. Uh, basically, you may actually have violate the thread safety guarantees, meaning uh, multiple threads can be in the same critical section at the same time because one function is not written in a thread safe manner. As a result, uh, you actually have a problem. So in this case, we're actually looking at persistence, which is different from uh, synchronization. There are similarities between uh, persistence characteristics of data and synchronization characteristics of data, but clearly they're also different semantically uh, because persistence is really about whether the data should survive uh, 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 power losses, right? Whereas uh, uh, synchronization is really about which threads are supposed to update this data and in what order potentially uh, and in what exclusivity rights. Uh, so there, there are similarities and differences, but both of them require some sort of isolation, let's say, uh, uh, to be able to do this update. So uh, both of them require some isolation and atomicity, 
uh, in the update. So transactional memory actually provides isolation and atomicity, which could be used for both, but you may need to do use other things for these two different aspects of data, uh, properties of data persistence and synchronization. Okay, but here it's similar. Uh, you need a new implementation of get chain function that is uh, that satisfies the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the persistence characteristics, meaning that you need to be transactional. Uh, and third party code can be inconsistent. What do you do about that? Ask the third party actually to write code uh, to have a good implementation that uh, satisfies this all or none property of atomic code blocks. Okay, there's more. What happens to your equal operator? What happens you, you get a you get a crash before doing your equal operator? Uh, is this prohibited? Is this allowed? If it's allowed, what does it mean? Uh, is there a transactional version of your equal operator? Existing operators are clearly not transactional, meaning you don't have this atomicity guarantee. So you need to be very careful, basically, when you're converting code from uh, 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 from existing code that doesn't care about the persistence of data structures versus code that requires that memory to be uh, is persistent. So there's a lot that you need to deal with clearly if you leave it to the programmer. And there's more actually in these papers that you that I mentioned, but uh, I'm going to cut it at this point, but clearly hopefully it's clear that there's a burden on the programmers. So our approach in this work was what we called transparent hybrid non-volatile memory. So it's a, it's a transparent persistent memory scheme. It's hybrid also because we basically said DRAM is essential uh, to get performance. Uh, and also to do the buffering sometimes. So we're, going, we're not going to get rid of DRAM. We're going to have DRAM and something like PCM. It's hybrid memory, but uh, this crash consistency problem, we're going to solve it completely in the system. Meaning we're not going to bother the programmers with any of these problems. The programmer can write programs as they are right now without modifying anything if they wish. Uh, and as a result, uh, they can still use persistent memory without running into any problems with crash consistency. Now this is, a very interesting approach, but also it's a very complex approach because to be able to support this, uh, you, need to be, you need to be able to have a fine grained checkpointing mechanisms as we will discuss. So our goal is really software transparent consistency, crash, crash consistency and persistent memory systems. And the key idea is really uh, basically if, if your programmer didn't provide any hints to you, uh, you're, you're, you should be able to checkpoint your architectural state so that you, could, you should be able to recover back to it if your system crashes. And you should be able to do that at any point in your program, at any instruction potentially, right? So that's the idea over here. Of course, we are a bit careful in terms of the overheads of this, as you will see uh, at a high level. Uh, but the idea is to periodically checkpoint the state and recover to a previous checkpoint on crash. So ideally, you would like to be able to recover to every single instruction. But of course, that's extremely high overhead. So we periodically uh, have checkpoints of architectural states, architectural state meaning registers, program counter, memory, anything exposed to the programmer, storage. Uh, so you need to be very careful, of course, in terms of the overheads of the checkpointing. And whenever you get a crash, you say, okay, I can recover the system and the software to the previous checkpoint. Uh, so clearly there's a recovery latency involved. Uh, if you're frequently checkpointing your architectural state, you can recover uh, much, uh, faster, potentially, uh, you, because you need to re-execute much less. Uh, but if you're uh, checkpointing once every milliseconds, for example, you need to be you, you can recover uh, you, you recover back a lot, basically. Uh, so clearly, there are a lot of interesting issues over here, and not all of the interesting issues are tackled in the paper. But, but the paper tackles the problem of how do we actually design the hardware and the system software to enable uh, this programmer transparent uh, mechanism. And in the end, uh, let me give you the high level summary. I'm not going to go into the details of this. It's a new hardware based checkpointing mechanism. Uh, it's actually uh, very clever. I think it has three characteristics. Uh, one is it, uh, it makes use of both DRAM and non volatile memory, basically. It makes use of the best characteristics of both. It checkpoints at multiple granularities to reduce both checkpointing latency and metadata overhead. So, DRAM, for example, writes are extremely slow uh, uh, to uh, non volatile memory. So, we keep writes buffered and DRAM, for example, uh, and that's important uh, for this to happen, for this checkpointing to happen. And you can read the paper for more detail. And very importantly, it overlaps checkpointing and execution to reduce checkpointing latency. So I'm going to talk about this in the next slide because this is really important. Uh, whenever you're doing checkpointing, uh, what you cannot do, uh, or 
what you can do, but have very high overhead is you execute and then spend some time checkpointing. And then that uh, time is spent only on checkpointing data, which takes time clearly. You should really be overlapping that time with uh, uh, execution of the new epoch, let's say. And as I said, it adapts to DM and non-volatile memory characteristics, uh, partially, partially with multiple granularities, but also uses non-volatile memory for checkpointing and DM for checkpointing cleverly as well. I'm not going to go into the details of this. And in the end, it's a complex system, which has a lot of interesting management mechanisms, but it gets very close to the performance of an idealized DRAM system, meaning uh, you have the characteristics of DRAM, but you also have the persistence. Uh, characteristics and in, uh, consistency mechanisms, uh, crash consistency mechanisms cause zero latency. So that's a very ideal system and we get very close to it. That's why uh, this persistent memory can be very interesting, I think, but you need to manage things really well. So let me talk about overlapping checkpointing and execution. So this figure shows you what you should not do whenever you design a checkpointing based system. So you, you do checkpointing based on upon epochs. So you basically run your program checkpoint and then you run, let's assume you get a crash in the second epoch right here. Basically, what you recover to is the beginning of that epoch, right? Because you've already checkpointed this epoch. Right? So that sounds good. You recover to this part and then you re-execute uh, from that part. And hopefully you don't get a crash and then you finish epoch one. If you get a crash here, you recover back to the beginning of epoch zero because you checkpointed whatever you did before. If you get a crash during checkpointing, you actually go back to, again, epic zero over here. So that sounds good. Basically, you lose data, hopefully very little, depending on how big your epochs are. But the problem is very high performance overhead over here. So you need to keep only one version of data clearly, the current version that you're running with updating and the old version that you checkpointed. So you should not overwrite checkpointed data. You need to keep the old version of the data. And whenever you overwrite it, you actually create a new version of the data because you may always go back to the old version if you have a crash, software crash, system crash, power loss, hardware fault, et cetera, many reasons for crash or error, okay? So this is good because the metadata overheads are relatively low. Uh, in the worst case, you need two copies of data, but you have dead cycles, meaning you have cycles where you do only checkpointing and nothing else. So, and those dead cycles are actually really bad. You don't want to do this. Uh, uh, this is similar to a, a problem we discussed, uh, refreshing, right? Uh, in, in memory, uh, do you do the refreshes only at the very end? So you do accesses and then all of the refreshes. But while you're doing all of the refreshes, you don't have enough time to do accesses because you have so many refreshes. And then you do accesses and then lots of refreshes. And then Epic is 64 milliseconds. And we said that that was bad, right? Uh, uh, it, as opposed to this, it's good to actually checkpoint while you're running. In fact, you can do some of that and also overlap checkpointing with running. So the solution we propose looks like this. You basically do running and checkpointing and you overlap uh, them. Of course, while running, some checkpointing is also happening. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but at the end, you need to do some things to actually ensure that checkpoint is correct. Uh, and you can read the paper for that. But now you can see that uh, you're, you start epoch zero over here. And at the end of epic zero, you start checkpointing, but you also start running epic one. And uh, at the end of epic, uh, at the end of checkpointing, uh, clearly you have uh, something over here. At the end of epic two, uh, uh, at the end of epic one, sorry, you start epic two and you, st you start running as you can see over here. So you can, this way you can overlap checkpointing and running. Uh, and as a result, you stall for checkpointing only very little maybe. Maybe there's some restart overhead uh, for or start overhead for running. Clearly, uh, you can see that we finished three epochs over here at the time frame of almost two epochs. Actually, at the time frame of almost two epochs. Uh, well, definitely two epochs because there there should be another running over here that I didn't show over here. Clearly, right? If your system keeps going, so basically your throughput is higher and your latency is also higher. Now the downside is if you do checkpointing this way, well, you have a problem. Uh, basically, uh, you need to have three copies of data, right? Because there are cases uh, where you uh, actually need to uh, go back uh, to one copy. Uh, so, for example, if you're here, uh, if you uh, if you crash over here, for example, uh, 
uh, you need to go back to the, the checkpoint over here. But uh, to be able to do that, uh, what do you need to do? First of all, you need to have the copy uh, that is unmodified over here. That's one copy. You need to have the copy that's checkpointing over here. That's the second copy. And you need to have the third copy that's being updated by this uh, epic one. That's the third copy. That's the idea. So you need to have three copies of the same data, assuming, of course, the data is updated. But of course, you need to keep track of which data is updated as well. So this increases the complexity, as opposed to having just two copies. So that's the downside of, and this is another, another example trade-off of reducing latency by uh, spending more area or space in storage. You reduce the latency of your program uh, clearly this way, but you need to spend more area uh, for your data storage because you need to have three versions of your data uh, to be able to recover in the worst case. Okay, uh, so that's one of the key things in this work. How do you do this checkpointing at low latency uh, without stalling for checkpointing at any point in time, hopefully, while uh, minimizing the overheads of the metadata uh, that you need to keep track of. Uh, and the metadata is there for the checkpointing, clearly. Uh, these are the versions of the data that you need to keep. Okay, so I'm not going to talk more about this. And this is a complex, another complex system paper. It's hardware software cooperative. Uh, and you need to modify both the hardware and the software. Uh, but in the end, it delivers a completely programmer transparent, as far as we know, the first programmer transparent mechanism for crash consistency uh, in hybrid systems. Uh, and it's the state of the arts still, as far as I know. Uh, and it's, it's, it, it examines one's extreme. So from our perspective, uh, uh, a lot of works uh, that came before or even after actually looked at the other extreme, which is, okay, let's throw the problem at the programmer here. We looked at the opposite extreme. Okay, let's not throw anything to the programmer. Maybe the systems programmer, of course, they need to do something to ensure that the system runs, but not the software programmer that's uh, as a user, let's say, uh, and let the hardware and the system handle crash consistency. And in the end, you will see a lot of complexity, but a lot of interesting ideas to ensure the complexity is minimal and the performance overheads are minimal also. And there's, I, I believe there's more work to be done uh, going forward uh, by managing uh, support uh, some hints from the programmer, uh, plus uh, mm, uh, hardware support as well. And also, I think there's more work to be done to look at more heterogeneous uh, array of devices. And this is one example of a persistent memory manager, actually, uh, even though uh, we didn't call it again that way. Uh, but it's one example of a persistent memory manager that automatically manages uh, the data placement underneath to ensure that there is no crash consistency for programs uh, that uh, are not rewritten uh, uh, in some way to provide hints or to provide uh, another different interface. Okay, uh, so clearly this is a challenge uh, in persistent memory. How do you ease the programming uh, to exploit this persistence? And there are many challenges over here. One is crash consistency. Okay, ignore crash consistency for now, which is a difficult problem clearly, but there's another challenge, uh, which is how do you convert your programs to take advantage of persistence? Uh, maybe you have persistent memory, you say, okay, I'm lazy, I'm not doing, going to do anything. Okay, you don't lose performance, etc. that's fine. But maybe you don't, you're not taking advantage of persistent memory really well in that case. So how do you actually take advantage of persistent memory? How do you design persistent data structures? Uh, how do you decide what should be persistent and what should not be persistent? So these are actually not so easy questions for a programmer. Um, I mean, one ballpark is, of course, whatever I'm doing, writing to files should be persistent or not persistent. That's a good start. But maybe there are other things that should be persistent and not persistent. When you have persistent memory, you may need to redesign your programs completely to take advantage of your persistence in the underlying memory. And uh, there are some works that are looking into this direction. I will briefly mention this work that we've done with VMware, uh, which I think is actually very interesting. Uh, this is a programmer transparent mechanism that tries, uh, not, not necessarily complete transparent mechanism, but uh, that helps the programmers uh, to decide which data structures should be persistent and which data structures should not be persistent. And I'm not going to go into the details of how this mechanism works, but you can read the paper if you're interested. But you can hopefully appreciate that this is not an easy problem in the end. Okay, so another challenge in persistent memory is security and data privacy issues. I'm going to summarize these very quickly. I'm not going to go into details of this. There are actually works that looked at, for example, where out attacks. We mentioned this when we discussed the endurance problems. If your memory is non-volatile, but it has endurance problems, 
uh, now you actually are subject to wear out attacks. If you're not doing a good job in terms of managing your memory, and actually a persistent memory manager is a good place to do to manage endurance problems as well, and maybe detect wear out attacks. If one of your applications is really writing in a pattern that's really bad uh, to, to, uh, that goes against your wear leveling, uh, it starts wearing out your memory, maybe you should be detecting them right somehow. Again, I'm not going to go through these issues, but this issue doesn't exist in uh, uh, memories that do not have endurance problems. Uh, and again, persistent memory manager is a good place to manage this. Hybrid memories, as we discussed, hybrid memories, even though they may solve some of the endurance problems, they may not be able to solve them completely, uh, but they may actually open you to some other attack, which uh, is similar to memory performance attacks at some level, uh, because of the management mechanisms that you employ in your hybrid memories. If you don't do a good job in terms of quality of service, fairness, and performance isolation, uh, you're, you may be back to something similar to memory performance attacks that we discussed very early in this course, right? Someone may actually uh, uh, do perform memory performance attacks and uh, some of your uh, uh, applications may not get uh, the right places, uh, right spots in your hybrid memory system. As a result, uh, they may actually be treated very unfairly. And this could lead to all of the problems that we discussed in terms of lack of quality of service and fairness. So clearly this is a security issue also. On top of this, we also briefly discussed that uh, whenever you have persistent memory, uh, data is not erased after power off uh, or system crash. Uh, as a result, you may actually have privacy breaches in addition to uh, reliability problems and dependability problems. Why? Because uh, let's say someone steals your phone right now, uh, uh, your, your data uh, that's in your main memory uh, now is uh, essentially uh, not erased, right? And someone, uh, as, we, as we discussed, I think at some point, we, you can do cold boot attacks, for example, to DM. Uh, even in existing DM, people have shown that you can do whatever, what is called cold boot attacks. You could take DM, uh, and uh, quickly freeze it, let's say, or uh, take it to very low temperatures. And as a result, DRAM doesn't leak data as much as we discussed also in the retention lectures. And you could plug the DRAM into some other device, malicious device, let's say, and you could read off data from that DRAM. And you could actually read off some private data that you're not supposed to read off. Uh, or you could read off uh, some data that's uh, some secret keys that allow you to uh, get on the uh, system uh, that the user has been using uh, because you actually have system data over there as well. So this could lead to privacy, privacy breaches as well as security attacks. So you could much more easily do those cold boot attacks in non-volatile memory because uh, now you don't even need to uh, 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 perform uh, cooling of your DRAM or taking it off potentially. Uh, so uh, non-volatile memory, because of its non-volatility, immediately leads to potential privacy breaches uh, of your data. And how do you solve that problem becomes interesting. Uh, clearly, you can employ methods like encryption uh, of non-volatile memory. Uh, then the question becomes, what data should be encrypted? Uh, is all of them encrypted? Is none of them encrypted? Uh, who specifies what should be encrypted if it's uh, some mix? Uh, and encryption also is not, does not come for free. Who, uh, who bears the cost of encryption of a very fast memory. Encryption is on the critical path, clearly. Uh, today, one of the reasons why DRAM is not encrypted in even security crypt critical devices sometimes is encryption takes a lot of time and DRAM is very fast. Uh, you don't want to spend uh, microseconds of encryption potentially on a nanosecond level device, clearly, right? And that's a similar problem over here. I think with non-volatile memory, issue becomes even uh, more imminent because uh, clearly, uh, someone doesn't need to do a lot uh, to be able to take your device and uh, read data off it uh, if, if data is, and data is not, is not erased somehow. Okay, so these are three examples of security and privacy issues of non-volatile memory, and there's still uh, research problems in the field. Uh, there's more, of course, that I'm not going to talk about, but uh, I think this is a good place to probably conclude uh, this. Any questions? I did not see any questions on my other screen, so I'm going to assume people will write questions. But again, feel free to shout also. Uh, OK, so I think we're concluding the Emerging Memory Technologies lecture. Uh, you've talked about a lot of interesting memory technologies and challenges and opportunities, clearly. Uh, 
I'm going to say that regardless of all of the challenges that we've discussed, I believe the future of emerging memory technology is bright. Uh, we have a lot of challenges in underlying technology, clearly, even in phase change memory, uh, even though there's a product in the market that's very much phase change memory based, uh, the underlying technology is still not as good enough. It needs to be improved. The manufacturing needs to be improved. So there is still a lot of manufacturing technology device related challenges in all of these technologies. And that's, I think, fascinating. There's a lot of work to be done in that area. And there's plenty of room at the bottom. If you remember our discussion uh, when, we said, when we talked about in the first lecture uh, that uh, some people argue that there's not plenty of room in the bottom. And I said that I disagree with that statement. Uh, there's plenty of room at the bottom at the nanoscale, uh, very low level device and technology uh, and circuit levels uh, to enable these technologies, uh, emerging technologies. Now, I think people who say who make that statement uh, dismiss emerging technologies for whatever reason, uh, either because they're thinking that these technologies can never be enabled or, uh, or they're, they don't have the right mindset of an architect, let's say. Uh, they're basically thinking, oh, you cannot modify this underlying level or, uh, or because I don't understand what's going on underneath, so I'm going to assume it doesn't exist, right? <laughs> and I've seen all of those mentalities, but I think there's plenty of room at the bottom and hopefully this emerging memory technology lecture shows you that. And I think processing in memory lecture also shows you that. But again, as I said, you can do much more of the bottom if you actually design the system together with it. So meaning uh, there's a, plenty of room at the top also to take advantage of uh, these technologies at the bottom. And what I described in this lecture is all about that again, if you uh, think about it, right? We have this device that's disrupting the system. There's plenty of room clearly in the device, but the system is bottlenecking it. So let's actually co-design the system together with the device and enable a persistent memory manager that can actually enable, uh, that can actually, uh, enable this device and also uh, create new opportunities uh, for managing our memory and storage system. So I think that's why the future of emerging technology is very bright and they can actually disrupt the systems and the applications and clearly overlying problems and requirements it may, be, may need to be adapted to take advantage of these technologies. And this can enable orders of magnitude improvements as we discussed, as I've shown you uh, earlier and new applications and computing systems. I've said similar things for processing in memory. If you remember, the slide was actually, something like the slide was actually covered earlier. Yet we have to think across the stack like we have done right now. I haven't talked, well, we talked about algorithms actually to manage things at the system level, but you may actually need to adopt your algorithms uh, to take advantage of the persistence of the underlying devices. Uh, because your current algorithms may be assuming your all of your data is volatile, right? But if all of your data can be persistent, how do you redesign your algorithms to take advantage of that? I, I know a lot of works actually in the database domain, for example, uh, that adapt your adapt algorithms to persistence. Uh, there are actually also uh, some algorithms that uh, try to minimize writes. These are called write preserving algorithms because they realize that writes are expensive in some of these persistent memory devices and they try to change the algorithms to minimize the writes. So that's actually very interesting also. So we have, these are examples of thinking across the stack and clearly persistent memory manager is an example of thinking across the stack. All the crash consistency mechanisms that we've discussed are thinking across the stack and we need to design enabling systems. And uh, again, uh, if there are naysayers, uh, I think uh, clearly we have uh, Intel persistent memory right now. Uh, in fact, I think they called, I don't know what they called, uh, Optane data center persistent memory, something like that. Uh, some odd name, but it's for to me, it's 3D X point device uh, that can be persistent. So clearly that exists. So that's one example. But uh, uh, all of these difficulty arguments have been made before. Flash memory is one example. I, I have also discussed this slide uh, in one of the earlier lectures, but flash memory was a very doubtful emerging memory technology for two, three decades. And uh, clearly uh, today uh, it has enabled, it has disrupted the systems that we designed, for example. I cannot imagine going back to having a laptop that just is a hard disk. It, it just is going to be too slow. I cannot imagine going back to a cell phone that I cannot carry basically because it doesn't have enough storage in it or whatever. Uh, so clearly this has disrupted the systems and uh, some other emerging memory technology could be similarly disruptive, assuming the systems are designed carefully for it. Okay, and maybe you read this paper that I've been uh, showing to you for some time now. 
Okay, so let me quickly talk about uh, some other research and design opportunities, uh, or at least summarize them because we've talked about all of them actually, I think, in this talk, and uh, not in, in this lecture, in the, in the previous lecture together. Uh, but there is a lot of opportunity actually in uh, emerging memory technologies. Uh, so actually one thing that's not on the slide is what about other technologies, right? Are there other technologies out there that's interesting to examine for, uh, for example, enabling completely persistent main memory, uh, merging memory and storage somehow, uh, uh, and getting rid of a lot of the system level complexity, getting rid of a lot of the pro programming level complexity. Uh, what are the other underlying devices that could be interesting than phase change memory, SDTM, RAM, et cetera? And also, uh, what are the system level things that we should do? That's interesting. What kind of computation mechanisms can we do? This is actually a very hot topic, as I mentioned. Uh, and how do we integrate those computation mechanisms better into the system? That's very interesting, clearly. We've discussed, we've, we've actually dedicated some time to it in the last lecture. Uh, hybrid memory systems, how do you actually manage hybrid memories? And if you have a persistent memory manager, how do you manage all those heterogeneous memory devices while providing crash consistency, while getting hints from the system software. So there's a lot of system software, hardware software co-design co co problems over here. Uh, it's not just hybrid memory systems like we discussed in the last lecture. I think the field is moving and really it's about how do you do the hardware software cooperative management of hybrid memory systems as opposed to doing pure hardware management, for example. Uh, and then security and privacy issues add another dimension as we've discussed in the prior, in one of the earlier slides. There's reliability and endurance related problems that are that the jury is still out for how do you, and again, uh, how do you ensure that this endurance problems don't get exposed to the system? Uh, maybe you solve the problems at the algorithm level as we discussed. And what are the other reliability issues uh, in addition to endurance? Uh, like Rohammer, is that still uh, applicable to uh, this sort of non-volatile memory? Uh, can we actually solve the Rohammer somehow with hybrid memory systems better, et cetera? There are a lot of interesting questions over there uh, clearly. Uh, and maybe are there other reliability problems that we should think about as we discussed in the last lecture? And I think all of these are very, very interesting. And uh, I will specifically mention one thing, uh, which is really this ad translation, address translation protection systems or virtual memory systems for the lack of a better word uh, for non-volatile memory or persistent memory management, uh, like we've discussed. Uh, how do we design, how do you rethink virtual memory whenever you have huge amounts of data that you need to manage with a uniform, unified interface to, let's say, all data. But to begin with, at least all data in your node. But I think all data is still very interesting. How do you actually uh, address all of your data? How do you do the translation, security uh, 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 issues, uh, and uh, uh, permission check issues for all of that data? Essentially, how do you design virtualized systems to enable uh, non-volatile memory and heterogeneous uh, main memory and storage? And again, as I said, virtual block interface is a really good start uh, toward this direction, and there's more to do in that area. And if you if you remember the virtual block interface uh, presentation uh, by Nastran, who, who's my PhD student, you can see that uh, uh, the, uh, heterogeneous memory was one of the motivations for it. Uh, but if you add the dimension of persistence to it, there's actually more to think about, as we clearly saw in this lecture. So there's there, there are really exciting topics to uh, redesign the complete stack if you will. Uh, and if you're successful, this could be completely revolutionary in terms of the design of the entire system, clearly. And I think that will also hopefully get rid of a lot of the baggage we have in existing systems because we have a lot of baggage in existing systems due to the assumptions we've been making. Virtual memory, for example, it was designed in the 1960s and we still have not changed the virtual memory much really uh, compared to the how it was designed and envisioned in the 1960s, even though Clearly, we have a lot of progress in emerging technologies like processing in memory and non-volatile memory. And we already have devices that can do those. And we're bottlenecked by virtual memory. Uh, and as you remember from the virtual block interface, we have heavy virtualization-based systems and we're bottlenecked by virtual memory interfaces that we have today for that also. So clearly, this is one example of what we should be rethinking uh, going into the future. Uh, it's, it's a high risk, high reward type of research, clearly. High risk is that you can develop a lot of cool ideas uh, and none of them may get adopted because it's too much high overhead to adopt, at least uh, in the next 10, 20 years, maybe. But you may actually develop a lot of cool ideas that may revolutionize the systems 
uh, if they get adopted as well. And in the meantime, you can develop ideas that can be adopted here and there as we discussed, right? So adoption, as we discussed in processing in memory is similar to adoption here in persistent memory, except here it's a bit easier in the sense that here you're not changing the execution model. Execution model remains the same. You're just changing the storage device, potentially the programming interface, et cetera. With PIM, you're, potentially, you're also changing the execution model, right? Uh, now you can execute inside memory. Uh, here, uh, uh, it may be a little bit less, but virtual memory is a part of the system. A lot of assumptions went into for decades and decades. So you're really running against 60 years uh, of virtual memory and uh, baggage of virtual memory. Okay. Uh, I think this is all I have for this particular uh, part of the lecture, lecture 16A. I'm happy to take questions for a couple more minutes. Otherwise, uh, let's take a break. Any questions? OK. So I don't see any questions. So uh, what we should probably do is take, uh, let's say, OK, 14.45. Let's take a 15-minute break, because I don't think I'm going to cover 16B uh, in the remaining time anyway. Uh, so let's take a 15-minute break. Let's go, come back at uh, 3 PM at 15 o'clock. Uh, and then we will start uh, the next lecture, which is going to be on another exciting topic.